Tell me you're excited to be here in God's presence, amen? Amen. Hey, we're in part two of a series called David, The Life of a King, and we're just studying this character, this man after God's own heart. If you missed last Sunday, it was part one, we talked about that, how David was a man after God's own heart, and how we too, like, that's not too lofty of a goal. Like, you can be a man or a woman after God's own heart. So if you missed that, go check that out. We also talked about how David is, is a type and shadow of Christ in the Old Testament. And types and shadows are actually all over the Old Testament where, where it shadows something in the new covenant of grace in the New Testament or in the life of Christ. And this is one of those types and shadows that, that in David's life and the way that God used and led David we see some reflections and mirrors of what happened in Jesus' life. So that was, that was pretty cool. Today we're going to pause in David's like story, like all the chapters, and that, that 66 chapters that have David in them of the Old Testament. And we're just gonna study one chapter today because I think it's that important. 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we're just gonna dive into that chapter because this is a very familiar battle that a lot of us know, David versus Goliath. Have you ever heard of David versus Goliath in here? Okay, so here's, here's what I want to talk to you about today. Like, how many of you have some giants in your life? Anyone got any giants in your life that have showed up in the last couple of months, in the last year maybe, maybe during quarantine or something, where maybe it was a giant bill that showed up, okay? Maybe it was a, it was a giant doctor's uh, report. It was a giant problem. There was a giant financial crisis. There was a giant health issue. There was a, a giant relational problem, a giant issue or a problem in your family. Um, I believe that there's going to be always giants that we face, always giants. And the greater your destiny, the bigger the giant. The greater the destiny you have, the bigger the giant you have to face. This in 1 Samuel chapter 17 is a story of how to kill a giant. I want to teach you today how to kill a giant. Can I get an amen? Yeah. All right. This is, this is the, the profile of a giant killer in the life of David and how to take out the giants in our life. 1 Samuel chapter 17. How many of you are ready to study the scriptures together? Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to start at verse 1. I got a lot of scriptures that we'll read to begin, and, and then we're going to jump into the principles. It says that Saul and the Israelites assembled encamped in the valley of Ella, say valley, and drew up the battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another, okay, and so there was this valley between them. The battle is always in the valley. Faith, that's where faith shows up is in the valley. We think faith more of the mountaintop experience. That's not where faith shows up. Sure, it lives there, but faith shows up in the valley. And some of you may be in a valley experience today. You may, you may feel like you're in a valley and that there's some things against you and giants against you and problems you're facing, and you feel like, like you're going under or that this thing's gonna defeat you. Can I tell you something? God's intention for the valley is not for defeating moments, but for defining moments. So if you find yourself in a valley today, I, listen, I got a different perspective for you. You're in a good place. You're in, the, pla you're in a, the exact place that God wants you to be. You're in the place not to be defeated. But right now where you're at, this is your defining moment. This is, this is not to defeat you. It is to define you. See, the, the Philistines, Philistines were at war with the Israelites because they wanted the Israelites' territory. And I'm here to tell you today, listen, that Satan is after your territory. The enemy wants the territory of your family. The enemy wants the territory of your marriage. He wants the territory of your mind. He wants the territory of your future. And he's not just after you. Listen to me, the battle that you're fighting in this valley is not just for you. It's for your children and their children. It's for your legacy. So the Philistines send their greatest warrior down to the valley. And his name was what? Goliath, we know, we know Goliath, okay? So they send Goliath, and in, in the Bible, like through the scriptures of 1 Samuel, you can read it, but it describes him a little bit. He is, and it's like cubits and all this stuff, but he's thought to be or, around nine foot six to nine foot nine inches tall. 
This is a monster of a man, okay? A beast creature of a, and it's like what he was like adorned with for battle was like metal and bronze, head to toe, helmet and chain mail. And, and it was, it's said to weigh his, just his armor, 200 pounds, okay? And the tip of his spear, the tip of Goliath's spear is 20 pounds, all right? This is a massive, and then it says that there's this, uh, a shield bearer, which, which would be that his height, nine foot nine inches, that was carried by some caravan thing was going before him. I'm just trying to paint the picture of imagine the giant. Imagine this monster of a man looking down at you from the valley. And, and it goes on in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 8. It says, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel. Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not the servants of Saul? He says, choose a man and have him come down to me. This was a very common practice of Eastern, in, in the time of this uh, history, that you would send a champion to battle. And so the, the Goliath was the Philistine champion, and, and the other army would send a champion, and whoever won, he says, if, if he's able to fight and kill me, we'll become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistines said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. And on hearing these words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. So they were, they were struck by fear, which is a, a tactic of the enemy to try to, get, to try to keep the giant not being addressed in your life. And then the story continues. It says, And I love how it says, now David. Someone say, now David. Now David, now David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was born from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and we learned about this last week, and in Saul's time, he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to war. So his three oldest were already there at the battle. And then look what he says. It says, for 40 days, Goliath came forward every day and taunted and diminished and demoralized the Israelite army, which is, I think, a really good picture of the giants in our life, like the giants of fear and the giants of anxiety and the giants of depression and discouragement. They don't just come at you one time and leave you alone. No, when they're not addressed, they come day after day after day and keep taunting and taunting you. In the evening, and he took his stand, and it continues, now Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these 10 cheeses as well. So basically, he was the pizza delivery boy. He's like, here you go. He said, take some pizza. Take some pizza to your brothers and the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring some assurance from them. He said, I want to know how they're doing. Early in the morning, David left the flock. I'm just trying to set up the scene for you guys, okay? Then we're going to get into some principles. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, because that's what he did, right? We remember, like, that was his role in the family. He was just the shepherd boy. And he loaded up and set out, check this out, just as Jesse, his father, had directed him. And I want to just kind of point out something right here, because there is a, an, another characteristic of David's life that continues to show up that we're going to study, and that is his honor and integrity, that he was in full, he was submitted to completely his father's authority in full submission to him, even though his father slighted him, overlooked him, maybe even mistreated him, didn't include him, like he was fully under his authority and submitting to his father. So here's a little side note today that I want to tell you, that you can't get over what God put under you if you refuse to get under whom God has put over you. Okay, and this is a common characteristic of David that shows up all throughout his life, you guys, that he was a man of honor, a man of integrity, a man that had character, and we're gonna study that in David's life here in the coming weeks. It continues in the 1 Samuel 17, verse 12. He reached the camp, that is, David reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other in that valley, and David left his things with the keeper of supplies and ran to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were doing. And as he was talking with his brothers, Goliath, the Philistine champion of Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And this time, David heard it. So I just want to make note, you guys, that this is the 41st day that Goliath came out and taunted 
Israel, but it was the first time David heard it, okay? It, and, and David wasn't impressed. See, see when, have you ever like faced a giant in your life? And then like three days later, you're like, man, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have handled it this way. Have you ever done that? Where hindsight, where in hindsight, all of us have great insight, don't we? Like it's almost infallible when we look back the hindsight, but David had the character and the faith to look at the present like he was looking at it in hindsight. He had the, the character and the faith to look at his present circumstance and see it through the lens of the future completion through faith and see it from a different reality so he, didn't, he was not afraid. He did not flee to the caves like everyone else. David responded a little bit different. It goes on. He says, whenever the Israelites saw this man, they fled from fear and great fear. They, they were running off into the caves. So David sees this and he goes, uh, what's going to happen here What's going to be done for the person, the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? And then they tell him King Saul's incentive plan. King Saul created an incentive plan of who's going to take out this, this monster for us. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage, which we, she was not a prize, by the way. We're going to get into that later. She was, this is not a good thing at all. <laughs> Hindsight is insight. Come on, somebody. I'm just kidding. You married her, okay? No. Ouch. I'm so sorry. Hey, give him his daughter in marriage, and, we'll, and, and they'll be exempt. Look, his family from, from taxes. Now, here's what I want you to see here, you guys, is that, that there's this giant, and if you kill this giant, he's saying this, that your financial status will change if you kill this giant. Your marital status will change if you kill this giant. Like, if you kill this giant, your, your, the trajectory of your destiny will change. And I believe there's some giants in this room today that if you kill, the, the atmosphere of your home will change. That if you kill this giant that's been taunting you, your, listen, it'll change who you marry. It'll change your financial outlook if you finally deal with that giant. It'll change your situation. It'll, if you deal with that giant of that secret sin that you've let live there, that shame, that fear, that guilt, that, that doubt, it'll change, I'm telling you, the trajectory of your destiny. And I'm, the devil wants to taunt you, to make you think you're unqualified, to, to get you to believe that the giant will always, that you'll never really be able to deal with it, that it'll always rule you. And I love David's response. David says this, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That's a curse word back in their day. He said, who the flip does this guy think he is? <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm sorry for saying that in church. And I'm just giving you context. Like this was a curse word. Like he's like, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David was gangster, bro. <laughs> David had like confidence and and you know why he had confidence? Because he knew who his God was. That's what gave him confidence. So if you want to kill the giants that are in your life, you got to do a few things. Let me give you the first few really quickly. Number one, you got to start seeing God through what God says about him. You, you, what you see, the way you see God changes how you approach the giants in your life. Some of you see God that he's mad. He's a mad God. He's an angry God. Some of you see God as like a sad God, someone who's despondent. Some of you see God as like a, a God that is not alive or active, or maybe he just doesn't care about the details of your life. But I'm here to tell you today that God is alive, and his eyes are ranging to and fro to see hearts that are fully committed to him. And he's looking for the next generation of giant slayers. He's looking for the next generation that knows the battle belongs to the Lord and looks the enemy right in the face. Amen, somebody? You have to, if you want to kill the giants in your life, you have to see God the, the, like the way that God says he is, not the way others say he is. And then number two, if you want to kill the giants in your life, you got to see yourself through what God's word says about you. Not what people say about you. Not what others say. Not what others think. Not what the giants are saying about you. Because you are more than a conqueror in Christ. That you got what it takes. You have everything that you need. You can do this, and God is with you. Amen? You got to see yourself differently. And then number three, you got to see your circumstances through what God says about your circumstances. 
See, because God's word says something different. Like you're believing something about your circumstances that is not in agreement with God's word. Because in God's word, the Bible says Red Seas can part. That Jericho walls fall down, that the blind can see, the lame walk, the deaf can hear, that the dead can rise, that every giant falls in God's word. So you got to, every circumstance you're facing right now, I don't care how big it is, I don't care how, like, like if you got the, the bills that you're facing, the loneliness that you're feeling, how far away marriage looks like to you, or a healthy marriage looks like to you, or a healthy family, or whatever you're facing that the enemy is telling you can never change. You need to start seeing your circumstances through what God says about your circumstances. Every giant will fall in Jesus' name. See, God never intended you to live with the giants in your land. He called you to drive out the giants from the land. And as soon as David started raising up a standard against the giant, look who starts talking back. Because not only, not only was it just Goliath talking back to David, but sometimes the insults come from those closest to you. Don't they? Look at verse 28. Let's, let's pick it up. Verse 28. When Eliab, that's David's oldest brother. We heard about him last week, remember? Where Samuel thought this was the guy, man. This was the guy. The oil almost dripped on him, basically, you know? And this is, this is that guy, Eliab. He heard him speaking with his men. And he burned with anger. The faith that you have is going to make other people angry. It is. The dream that you have is going to make others feel insecure and feel like they need to cut down your dream, okay? Uh, so he's speaking with men, and it burned with anger at him, and he asked, why have you come down here, David? And with whom did you leave those few sheep? He's like, like you just a little, where'd you leave? He's just demeaning him now. You're the little shepherd. Well, you, you just supposed to watch. What'd you do with those few sheep, David? You leave them in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are, how wicked your heart is. Eliab knew about David's history, but he didn't know about David's destiny. There are some people who know about your history, but they aren't connected to your destiny. They'll try to remind you of who you used to be. Oh, I know who you used to be, and you used to do this, and you've done that, and you did this, and you said that, and you used to smoke this or drink that. Aren't you, aren't you thankful for the people who don't remind you of who you used to be, but believe in who you're called to be? And see the potential inside of you? I'm so thankful for the men and women throughout my life that they saw me for my potential and who I'm called to be. They didn't see me for my mistakes and my, my past and even my current issues. They saw something different. I'm so thankful for those people in my life. And David knew who he was because he knew whose he was. And if you want to defeat the giants, hey, write that one down. Number four, you got you to gotta know who you are by knowing whose you are. You are a child of God. You are a son of God, a daughter of God. Your identity is not in your ability. Your identity is not in your status. Your identity is not in your financial income. Your identity is not in your family or your past. Your identity is in Christ. And no matter how much you messed up before you even came to church today, you could have been yelling in the car before you came here. Last week, you could have fell off the wagon. God still loves you, has a plan for your life. He is still for you, and he's going to help you defeat the giants in your life. Don't let the enemy of self-defeat and condemnation talk you out of God's plan for your life. Some of us are... There's a bunch of us, I think, that the giant is not across the battlefield. It's across the mirror. It, it, it's, it's, what, it's how you see yourself. It's what you say to yourself. It's how you talk to yourself and what you think about yourself. You got to, if you want to kill the giant, you got to know who you are by knowing whose you are. And I want to look, look how David responds to his brother in verse 29. He says, now what have I done? Like, what have I done now, man? You always messing with me, bro. Now what is it? He said, can I even speak? He then, what'd he do? Say it out loud. He turned away. See, David knew that he could throw stones at Goliath, but he couldn't throw stones at his brother. And I want you to know today, that today a lot of you are fighting unnecessary battles against people that are not even your real enemy. You're fighting battles against brothers and sisters when your enemy is across the battlefield. 
And people, listen, people will criticize you. They'll falsely accuse you. They'll say all kind of crazy things about you. But when you know who you are and whose you are and you're living for God's plan for your life, you keep moving forward. You don't quit. You don't stop. You don't get caught up in meaningless battles. You fight on the right battlefield. Amen? See, because the real enemy is not your brothers and sisters. It's not those other people. It's not your spouse. It's not your boss. Your real enemy is the prince of darkness. That's your, that's your real enemy. He's trying to bring strife and get you distracted and fighting battles that are unnecessary. You need to keep focus and fight the real enemy. So Saul hears about this. And in verse 33, he says, now chimes in to David, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man. And he's been a warrior from his youth. So last week we saw that David's father, Jesse, didn't think he had king potential, and he wasn't in the lineup. And now we see Saul doesn't think he has champion potential. Saul discourages him, but David has been a warrior from his youth. And so if you want to defeat the giants, if you want to kill the giants in your life, you got to do number five, and that is you got to remember your victories. Because if he did it then, he'll do it again. Look, if he did it then, God can do, he is able. Verse 34, David said to Saul, Look, I know what you're, he didn't get caught up in what he was saying, what Eliab was saying, what other people are thinking, what the giant is thinking. He said, no, 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 let me tell you, Saul, something. Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. And I know that seems like a small task to some people. Some people make fun of me about that. Eliab thinks I'm not doing something that matters, but what I did, I did with excellence to honor my God. Amen, somebody? I did with all my heart and did it with honor. When a lion or bear came up and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And check out what he says again. He says, and this uncertain, this mother Gemma Philistine will be like one of them. David, I'm telling you, David was real because he has defied the armies of the living God. Some of you, listen, you are are letting the enemy like beat you up day after day, taunt you and humiliate you and speak to you on a daily basis. And sometimes, honestly, it's not even the enemy. It's your own voice. You're, you're, like, you're, you're, ta- you're like, oh, I'm so unqualified. I'm, I'm unworthy. I've never fought a giant like this before. I've never raised kids. I've never, I, I didn't have a good example of being a good father or being a good, being a good mother. I, I don't know how I'm going to get up from this mistake I made. I just don't know how I'm going to face this. And we beat ourselves up. And here's the problem. We mistakenly remember what we should forget, and we forget what we should remember, okay? We remember all of our mistakes and our past and our shame and our failures, and God has already forgot them. He cast them as far as the east is from the west. Move on from that. You need to remember your victories. You need to remember your successes. Some of you are like, well, I don't have very many victories. You're still breathing today. The enemy has not won. He has not taken you out. You're still standing, and there's still time on the scoreboard. Get up and face your giant. David convinces Saul, but Saul thinks he needs a little help still. Check it out. The story continues. Saul dressed David in his own tunic, and he put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened his own sword over the tunic and tried walking around, but it wasn't used to him. He's not, he's not a soldier like, like King Saul. And he said, I can't go in these because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Saul expected David to struggle in his battle with Goliath, but you can't wear the expectations of others when you engage your assignment. I remember when um, we were being preparing and prepared to plant this church years ago. And, and we had to go through the process, and like, we, there, there was a part of the process was actually preaching a message before a panel. There was a panel of pastors that were going to critique, critique my, my message, and, and, and uh, they told me, they, they suggested that I was a little bit too confrontational, and, and, uh, and they said I need to dial it down if I wanted to grow a church. <laughs> and so, but I wasn't interested in growing a church. I was interested in reaching the lost and making disciples. And they said, they said and, and keep it shorter, which they still try to tell me today. 
uh, 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 still working. So I tried. I tried. But it wasn't me. So at, at, one, at one point, I just decided I'm going to preach with authority and energy, with passion, with edge. And sometimes I'm going to be long. Sometimes I'm going to be loud. Sometimes I'm going to be fast. Sometimes the clock's going to go to red. Sometimes I ain't going to look at the clock. And you know what? Something happened. People just kept coming back. Um, your anointing flows freely when you tap into the vein of your unique abilities and your distinct passions. Hey, mediocrity is mass produced. Destiny is custom designed. That armor don't fit you. You weren't called to wear their armor or to look like them or to fight like them. So the story picks up in verse 40. Come on, are you receiving something today? Story comes up, verse 40, he, he, he takes off that armor. He says, this ain't me. I can't fight like you. I can't fight like you. I, it's not my thing, I, but I know God has trained me how with this staff and with this sling, he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the stream and he put them in his pouch of his shepherd's bag and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was a little more than a boy. Look at his <laughs> glowing with health and handsome, which probably infuriated this ugly dude even more. He's like, who this? And he despised him. And he said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And he said, come here, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and, your, and to the wild animals will eat you. Look, he was trying to intimidate, to scare him into silence. And that's what your giants would try to do. So here's this. If you wanted to kill the giants in your life, number six, you have to learn how to speak faith to your giant. To speak faith. Hey, don't let the giants do all the talking. You got to control the volume in the valley. You got to control the narrative in the valley. You cannot overcome your giants by staying silent. There is power in your words. Your words matter. Let me say it like this. Stop talking about your giant and start talking to your giant. Some of you have been talking about that thing long enough, complaining about it and whining about it, and, and everybody knows your issue. It's time for you to start speaking faith to the giant themselves. Stop talking about it and start talking to. I learned if you don't talk to your giants, your giants talk to you. And you may, you may speak faith to your giants, and it may look like nothing is changing, like day after day or, or month after month. It may look like nothing is changing in the natural realm, but I promise you in the spiritual realm, it's moving. There are things that are moving. See, Jesus gave us this example, right? Jesus spoke to bad weather. He spoke to sickness. He spoke to fevers and water and dead people and demons and all obeyed his voice when he spoke. And then he said, greater things will you do. When you speak, when you ask in my name, you will do greater things. One day, Jesus was walking by a fig tree and it didn't have any fruit. And he, and he cursed the fig tree. Do you remember that story in Mark? He cursed the fig tree and he said, like, and he commanded the tree that it would not bear fruit for the rest of its life. Jesus didn't pray for the tree. He didn't say, I believe this tree isn't going to bear any more fruit. No, he commanded the tree. And then when he walked away, um, the tree, as he walked away, was still as green and as tall as it was before he said the words, which I think the disciples, after Jesus commanded it and walked away, I think some of them probably thought or even said, wow, look at that. Jesus losing his powers. Jesus must be losing his touch, looking what happened to the tree. But after night time and the next day and they come back to that tree they see that it was fully dead and withered which which listen sometimes it looks really dark and like nothing's happening but i'm telling you daybreak is coming you keep speaking faith into your look and i, I here's a big key i discovered my giants respond to my voice okay like like i'm gonna pray for you and declare over you and, and speak faith over, but look your giants don't respond to my voice they respond to your voice you need to learn how to speak faith to your giants. That's why they try to silence you, to drown you out with noise and fear. Notice though that David didn't get sucked in to the insult contest. Goliath is insulting him of how he looks and his, what, is, what, he's, what he's wearing and what he's coming to the battle with. And he's, he's just insulting and he does not get into an insult contest with the enemy. Look what it says. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you. I want us to say this out loud. Come on, one, two, three. I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. David says, I know who this battle, the battle belongs to the Lord. And this day, he's going to hand you over into my hand. 
So here's, here's, here's what we need to do. Don't hide. Don't run in the caves. Don't be silent. You show up and speak faith to your giant. Amen? Verse, here's the next verse, verse 45. It says this, that as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David did what? He ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. So if you want to defeat the giant, you want to kill the giants in your life, write this down. Number seven, attack the giant quickly. Because the longer you wait, the bigger the giant gets. The longer that that addiction builds in your house, the bigger it gets. The same day David heard the giant was the day David defeated the giant. Was the day that he decided to handle it. Here, let me say it this way. Don't dwell on it. Deal with it. Come on. And as I said that, I believe that right there, that you, there was a revelation of what your giant was. That something happened right as I spoke that right there. I, I just felt the release in the atmosphere that some of you didn't even know that the giant was there anymore because you've been comfortable with him and you've rearranged your life around him and you forgot that that giant had control and territory. And right now you got a revelation. Somebody give God some praise right now. Deal with it. Don't dwell on it. You deal with it. He didn't wait two weeks. He didn't wait a year. He didn't wait two years. He didn't say, let me play in the field with this a little bit. No, he said, I got an appointment with my destiny right here. There's an award on the other side of my obedience. And the longer I wait, the bigger it's going to get. So I'm going to attack this thing quickly. This thing's going down today. Verse 49, reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The God will always show you the vulnerable spot of your giant. He'll give you a strategy for that giant. He's not undefeatable, I promise you. He'll show you the strategy of how to take that giant down. I don't care how big it is. I don't care how long it's been taunting you. There is a strategy to defeat that giant. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and stone without a sword in his hand. He struck down the Philistine and killed him. Final step in killing your giant, we learn from David, is so important. Kind of gruesome, but it's important. Number eight, cut the head off the giant. Cut the head off the giant. Look what he says in verse 51. I know it's gruesome, but look at this. David ran and stood over him like a boss. Come on, somebody, little old David. Nine foot nine giant, all decked out in armor, slinging his hand. He took hold of the Philistine sword, that big old sword. He drew it from its sheath, and after he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. What, what, you need to cut the head off the giant. What I'm saying here is that there is a finality to the victory that you need to make sure that that some of you need to take divorce off the table. You need to get it out of your vocabulary. There needs to, you need to cut the head off the enemy and say that word does not exist in this house anymore. You need, some of you need to change your number or block that caller because you're messing around too much with someone you know you shouldn't be talking to. And it's going too far. You need to cut the head off that thing. I don't care if you have to change your jobs. I don't care if you have to move into another state, you cut the head off of that giant and bring a finality to your victory. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. I got, here, let me give you these three, then what is the profile of a giant killer? And then, then I wanna show you something else here in this story. The profile of a giant killer, really quickly, go ahead and put them all up. See clearly, write them down, see clearly, act confidently walk humbly. Hey, you want to kill the giants? You're like, you got to see clearly. You got to fix your orbit. You got to see God the way you're supposed to, where, the way he sees himself. You got to see your circumstances and know who you are. See yourself the way God sees you. You got to see clearly if you want to kill the giants in your life. And you got to act confidently. Stop responding to your fear and respond to your faith. Go out into that battlefield. Here's the thing. The closer you get to your enemy, the closer you get to the giant, the smaller they become. That's a lie of the enemy, that, that, that how, he, how big he looks. No, it's actually the opposite. The closer you get to that lie, the more exposure of the illusion that it becomes. This is not what it thought of. The, he was, he was all, all bark and no bite. Act confidently and then walk humbly because when you start defeating your giants in the valley, God will give you a mountain, but the enemy will 
try to attack you with pride and ego, and you got to walk humbly now. Okay, that's, that's a little bit where we're going, but let me, let me tell you today, because I believe God wants to do something powerful today. Um, this, and we're going to have the team come on up, man. Come on up, team. Um, this, this giant Goliath, this champion Goliath, is, is a representative of the Philistine army, but not only that, remember there's types and shadows here, okay? David, as he steps out onto the battlefield, as the champion selected for Israel is a type and shadow of Christ. That, listen, Galatians says that Jesus has disarmed all power and authority and triumphed over the enemy on the cross. That, that when the Philistine giant champion Goliath steps on in the battlefield, it represents all of the plan of the enemy to steal, kill, and destroy you, your legacy, your purpose, and God's plan for your life. But as David stepped out onto that battlefield, he represents Christ, our champion, who not only disarmed the authorities and powers, but he, the Bible says that Jesus uh, uh, crushed the head of the serpent once and for all, that he went to Hades and took the keys of death with him. And just as, just as David cut the head off the giant, Jesus cut the head off the serpent and giving you the victory already. So today I want you to see that, that that giant you're facing, you don't face it by yourself and with your own armor. You can't wear that armor. You can't fight the battle like the world fights. You can't fight in your own strength. You fight with the armor of the Lord. You fight with the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the, the, your, your feet fitted with the gospel of peace, the, the breastplate of righteousness, your belt of truth. You put on Christ as you fight that battle because he is your champion that has already won the victory. Come on, are you seeing this, somebody? Hey, today, I'm just, today, the giants are going down. Today, we are killing the giant in our life that has been taunting the giant that has been making you afraid and worried and anxious and has been trying to destroy your children and your family and your purpose and your purity and your mind, that giant right now is getting killed in Jesus' name. We're gonna cut the head off the giant today. Can I pray for you with every head bow? Come on, every head bow, every eye closed. Some of you are here today and, and maybe you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, like to think of him as your champion and fighting your battle for you and and that the battle belongs to him. That's never something you have kind of known or received or walked in. Here's what the Bible says. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Like right now, you can get a fresh start. Some of you need it. And you're tired of trying to do it yourself, fight the battle yourself, ignore the issues, act like they're not there. Like all that stuff, you know it ain't working. And today you need to surrender the control of your life to Jesus. I'd love to pray for you, whether it's your first time making a prayer like this of surrender or you need to do it again. I'd love to pray for you first. Then I'm gonna pray for all these giants that are going down today. But I'm gonna start right here because this is the first giant. The first giant is you. You need to die to yourself and make Jesus the Lord of your life. Give him control. Some of you need to do it for the first time or some of you need to do it again. But with every head bow, I'm not gonna have you come up or anything at this point. But just right there, if you know that's you, on the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand. If you say, no, that's me, I need, I'm surrendering, I'm dying. I need to go down. <laughs> and I'm giving up to the control of Jesus today. Come on, if that's you, be bold. One, two, three, lift up that hand and lift it high right now. Come on, come on, come on. Yes, 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 all over this place. Come on, leave it up, leave it up, leave it up. Yeah, 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 yeah. All over this place, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus all over today, 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 God, I'm yours. I surrender. I surrender. I surrender. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and put that hand down. And when you pray something like this, just say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today, I surrender the control to you, and I make you my Lord. Come live inside of me and make me brand new. Change me, God, from this day forward. God, right now, I speak over every giant, over every enemy, over every giant that has existed in our land, in our life, trying to take our territory, to rob our family, to rob our marriage, to rob our identity and our calling and our purpose. Today, we are delivering a final blow and cutting off the head of the enemy, and we're not fighting the battle alone. You are our champion, and you've gone before us, Jesus, so we fight this battle. 
not on our own, but in you. Jesus, I declare right now, the giants are destroyed in Jesus' name. Come on, will you do me a favor? Just in that spirit, will you stand up? Because we're going to have a time of worship. I don't want anyone to leave and miss it at this time. Come on, will you just stand up? And we're going to declare the victory today. And I just felt this stirring as I was preparing. And this is not something that we usually do here at Discovery. We do it only as we're led to do it. But today, some of you, I feel like, need to like step out of your seat and run quickly to the battle line today. Like you need to, you need to go quickly. You need to deliver a blow tonight or today to the enemy, a final blow and cut the head off. And I would love to invite you. And we're going to worship in a moment. But right now, I'd love to invite you. If that's you and you know you need to deliver a final blow to the, the giants in your life, will you come forward? Will you just come forward in this altar? We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to lay hands on you. We'd love for you to just today take the authority. Take the authority. Speak in faith today to your giants. Get up. Face that giant. Stop living with that giant there anymore. Don't let him taunt you. Don't let him lie to you. He's just getting larger. You get closer though, and you're going to see it for what it is. It's a lie of the enemy, and you've already had the victory. God, we thank you. 